Introducing YouTube memberships, a fun way to support the channel while getting some exclusive perks. Click the join button to become a member now and get benefits like badges next to your name on videos, behind the scenes photos, advantages during the live trivia game, discounts on merchandise, private one-on-one -on -one video chats, the ability to request future video topics, and exclusive 8-10 to 10 minute videos on the history of the NFL. And now, on with our feature presentation. When people talk about the worst head coaches of all time, this man right here, Les Steckel, is right near the top of the list. Under the guidance of the late great Bud Grant, who you can learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner, the Vikings were always a pretty respectable team. At worst, they were mediocre. And then, Les Steckel came in and undid all of that in one year by doing a job so bad that it essentially forced Grant to come out of retirement to right the ship. I am not exaggerating when I say that, much like I could do about 20 different stories on Urban Meyer's time with the Jacksonville Jaguars highlighting how bad of a coach he was, I could do about 20 different stories on Steckel. I could talk about the time he compared losing one of his players to losing a casualty in the Vietnam War, which is an awful simile for obvious reasons. I could talk about the time he told two of his players that they could leave early in the middle of the game, only to then fine and suspend two players for leaving early. I could talk about the time that he never told his center, Ron Sams, that he was snapping the ball too low, and Sams had no idea about it until after the game when he watched the tape, which led to Vikings quarterback Archie Manning getting sacked 11 times. I could talk about his coaching techniques and mannerisms in motivating his players and getting the most out of them, which were all absolutely horrible. Seriously, it was that bad, and each story gets worse and crazier than the next. And in due time, seeing as I post about 340 videos a year on the history of the NFL, we'll eventually get to all of them. But the one that we're going to focus on today truly highlights how from day one, he was way in over his head. Because something that Steckel always preached was communication, and the importance of having good communication and making sure that everyone is on the same page. Well, so much for practicing what you preach. Because to start off the 1984 season, Steckel decided that he was going to surprise his team by not telling the players what their role was, and by not telling them who would be starting. It's one thing to do this to the media and not announce it publicly, or to gain some sort of competitive advantage. But to do it to your own team, especially at the wide receiver position, which is how Steckel got the job in the first place, seeing as he was a wide receivers coach, so he of all people should have known better. Yeah, this was an absolute disaster. It alienated one of the best and most important players on the team. And it's a story that deserves a deep dive today, because it truly showed just how inept he was. Because this is the story behind just one of the many controversies surrounding the 1984 Vikings. Before I talk about the actual controversy in question, we need some context to understand the wide receiver that was involved in all of this, and what his relationship with Steckel was prior to this since Steckel was the wide receivers coach on Bud Grant's staff for half a decade. This man right here is Sammy White, and it truly is unfair just how many good wide receivers the Vikings have had in their franchise's history, where a guy like this is just a blip on the radar despite how great he was. When you think of the greatest receivers in team history, you're probably thinking of guys like Randy Moss, Justin Jefferson, Chris Carter, and Ahmad Rashad just to name a few, before this guy ever crosses your mind. Which is crazy, because Sammy White was an incredible receiver. When the Vikings chose the Grambling Man in the second round of the 1976 NFL Draft, little did they know that they were going to draft a man that, for the next decade or so, was going to give opposing secondaries fits and opposing defenses nightmares. I would be here all day, if I listed all of his stats and all of his accolades. So I'm not going to do that. 
since the drama that he eventually had with his former receivers coach turned head coach is more important. However, here are just some of the highlights. He was named the AP Offensive Rookie of the Year in 1976 after a campaign where he finished 5th in the league with 906 receiving yards and 3rd in the league with 10 receiving touchdowns. He made it to the Pro Bowl not just in 1976, but in 1977 as well, when he finished inside the top 10 of the league with 760 receiving yards and 9 receiving touchdowns. From 1976 to 78, he had 28 receiving touchdowns, not just making him the only player in the league to have at least 9 receiving touchdowns in each of those 3 seasons, but giving him the most receiving touchdowns in the NFL over that 3 year stretch. By the time we were entering the 1984 season, White had 364 receptions for 5,925 yards and 49 touchdowns. And this doesn't even take into account his five receiving touchdowns in the playoffs, with one of them coming at Super Bowl XI against the Oakland Raiders. And entering the 1984 season, he had the most receiving yards in franchise history and had the most receiving touchdowns in franchise history blowing by the old record of 34 by Ahmad Rashad, who you can learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner. Safe to say, Sammy White was a good receiver, and even if he was showing some signs of slowing down as he was heading into his 30s, everyone knew that he was a good wideout. And one of the men who knew this, and was not afraid to praise him? None other than Les Steckel. When Steckel was coaching White back in 1983, White was having a conversation with a reporter. Steckel was passing by and told the reporter in the middle of the conversation, you're talking to the best wide receiver in the National Football League. Not only the best wide receiver in the National Football League, but he's another coach on the field. That's how valuable he is. Whether I would go that far, yeah, I don't think so. But according to Steckel, White was a star and was the best wideout in the NFL. Which is what makes this drama all the more hilarious when you realize just how Steckel decided to treat White to open up the 1984 season for some bizarre reason. You didn't see a whole lot of three wide sets, especially to start a game out back in 1984, which means that you were starting two receivers. For most of the game, you are rolling with two wideouts, meaning that two guys are going to get the bulk of the work. One of them, in the eyes of this man right here, Les Steckel, was going to be Mike Jones, the team's sixth-round pick out of Tennessee State from the 1983 NFL Draft. He didn't play a whole lot in 1983, only having six catches for 95 yards and never finding the end zone. He was pretty buried on the depth chart but Steckel liked what he brought to the table and loved the improvement that he made from year one to year two. Which raises the question, if Jones is taking over a starting spot, who's got the other one? And who's getting demoted as a result? Between the two men that people expected to be starting going into the season, Sammy White and Terry LeCount, the veteran wideout entering his seventh season in the league, and the man who followed Steckel from San Francisco to Minnesota, who's riding the pie? And who's going to be getting the bulk of the reps? And if you think this story is going to be about Steckel benching White one year after calling him the best receiver in football, and just about a player upset that he's getting benched, oh no. That would make too much sense. Because this truly is a story about how absolutely incompetent Steckel was. Because in Steckel's eyes, he didn't want any of them to ride the bench. And I don't mean that he planned on rotating the three men in and out or anything like that. I meant that he just didn't want to name a starter and didn't want to name a bench player. I meant that he said that he had three first team receivers on the team and said that he genuinely couldn't decide who was going to start and who was going to ride the bench. You can't upset any players if you don't tell them what you're going to do, right? He had no idea what he was going to do. He had no game plan. And he wasn't even going to tell the team 
or the receivers anything at all. It's one thing to be a starter, and it's one thing to ride the bench. But to not even know your role because your coach of all people can't make up his mind and not even tell the team or tell you about it? That is amateur hour right there. And to say that White was confused about what the heck was going on, especially because Steckel loved the man throughout his entire time in Minnesota and was heaping nothing but praise on him every single day, would be an understatement. It's almost like the company that's doing well, that isn't going through any layoffs whatsoever, and you get praised nonstop about how great of a job you're doing and what an asset you are to the company. And then, out of nowhere, you get fired. And you're the only one to get fired while they bring two more people on at your same salary. So it's not like it was a cost-cutting measure or anything like that. White was just baffled by this, and you can't exactly blame him. Said White about this madness involving Steckel, He always helped broadcast me. I don't know what happened. This was the first coach at the pro level who ever took me out of the offense. I know you have to put the team before yourself, but you have to have personal pride too. And White made an ultimatum to Steckel. Make up your mind about who the heck you're starting, or I'm out of here and requesting a trade. I'm not doing this wishy-washy status. I'm not going to go through the whole season with my status in limbo. Again, keep in mind, this was not during training camp, and this was not during the preseason. This was at the start of the regular season, when depth charts should absolutely be in order. And when once again, Steckel decided not to tell anyone what he was doing, White had enough. He spoke to the press and raved about Bud Grant, his former coach, while criticizing Les Steckel, saying, I thought stats were one of the best credentials you could have. You can see this here, it doesn't mean one thing. We can ask the defensive backs now who they have the toughest time covering, and I'm pretty sure I get all the votes. If you took a survey when Les got the job and asked players how many of them thought I wouldn't start, I figure you'd get all no. If Bud Grant was here, do you think he'd have three number one receivers? Let's be realistic. He should just make up his mind one way or the other. In and out? Nah, I don't like it. If he starts me one week and Terry the next, I will ask them to trade me. Trading me might be the solution to the problem. So you would figure that this would be the end of it, right? White made his demands known. Steckle still refused to do anything. Again, White wasn't demanding that he start. All he was demanding was that he and LeCount knew what their status was, which seemed like a fairly normal thing, and seems like how literally every other team runs. Steckle didn't do that, and now, White requested a trade and was at his breaking point. However, in the bizarre year of Les Steckel in charge, Steckel overheard White talking to the reporters and started yelling in the hallways loud enough for everyone to hear. Steckel yelled, in what has to be the craziest way to quash this beef for the time being, Tell them, Sammy, you're my starter. You're the smartest player I ever coached. I'm not going to trade you. You're my guy. Seriously. After all of that, Les Steckel actually yelled that out. I'm sorry. What? Okay, time, time out. First off, I'm just trying to imagine a situation like this today, where a player on the Steelers criticizes Mike Tomlin for doing something, and then... Tomlin yells down the entire hallway, screaming out to the world that he goofed up and shouldn't have done that. Just the image of this is amazing, and I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall 40 years ago when all of that played out with Steckle. But number two, if you were going to call Sammy White the best receiver in the NFL and the smartest player you've ever coached, why the heck did he let this drag on for so long and let it drag to White's absolute breaking point. Why didn't he just announce him as the starter all along? 
you're telling me that you, as in a wide receivers coach, who more than anyone else, knows the importance of letting receivers know their role on the team, thought that the best course of action was to not tell White anything, refused White's very reasonable request, let White issue his ultimatum, and then get on your hands and knees begging for forgiveness immediately by calling him the smartest player he's ever coached and by giving him the starting spot? To do it at this very moment too almost makes it look like if you complain to the coach about your playing time and say start me or I'm leaving, you're going to win and the coach will play you. The optics on this from Steckle's perspective just look absolutely horrible. Of all the ways for Steckel to handle this situation, this might have been, by far, the worst possible way. To the point where even White was confused as to what the heck just happened. And can you really blame him? The way this works with a normally functioning team is that there is a debate between who to start. The coach calls the receivers in question to his office and breaks the news to them that announces to the press why he made this decision. The way Steckle did it was to just not say anything until both guys were fed up, until one of them requested a trade, and then to yell across the hallway his decision. You can see why he was such a bad head coach, right? Oh, and to make matters even more confusing in an already confusing situation, the Vikings decided to cut LeCount, as in the other wide receiver in this battle alongside Sammy White, a few days later for an attitude problem. Even though LeCount never said a word, and was a notoriously quiet guy, and a guy that Steckel coached for more than half a decade between San Francisco and Minnesota. I don't know how you go from the quote-unquote number one receiver on the team to cut in less than a week. But somehow, LeCount found a way thanks to whatever the heck Les Steckel was doing as the head coach of the Vikings. Good job there, Les. You really found a way to manage this self-inflicted crisis. And by a way, I mean the worst way possible. So what do we learn from all this? If you're going to make a decision, then for the love of God, make the decision. If you're going to break the news about the decisions of the involved parties, maybe yelling it across the hallway isn't the best way to do it. If you're going to keep someone's status in limbo, and the players in question ask for their status, and you say absolutely nothing, then maybe you weren't qualified to be a head coach. And let's just be honest. If you're going to make a decision, the best idea is to think of whatever the heck Les Steckel would do. And then, do literally the exact opposite. Because this, along with about 10,000 other things that happened during that one disastrous year of terror, show just why Les Steckel could not stick around in Minnesota. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jj9shop.com and be sure to like and subscribe, as it really helps the channel out a lot. Join me every Wednesday night where we'll play NFL trivia for cash prizes at 9pm Eastern over on Twitch. To learn more about the history of college football, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To learn more about the history of Major League Baseball, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 7. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.